So before we start, how many of you have worked with WebDriver, used WebDriver? Great. How many of you have used uh, Java language? Uh, apart from Java, any other language? Anyways, majority <coughs> of you are using Java, that's uh, great. That should be a nice foundation uh, for this. Okay. So just to set the context uh, right, uh, let's quickly go through some uh, basic things. So you know you have web driver. So uh, in this presentation by Selenium, I mean only web driver. We're not going to talk about uh, Selenium 1.2. Uh, so Selenium web driver is an uh, abstraction for our uh, you know, multiple uh, browser implementation. Or uh, instead of uh, writing tests or automation scripts for each browser, you just uh, write using uh, WebDriver API, and uh, <coughs> then you can run it on any of the browsers. That, but ideally, the, there should be an implementation uh, of WebDriver for, for the specific uh, browsers. That's, uh, so at this time, people write their automation scripts write a, directly using WebDriver API. So is it, a, is it a good thing or not so good thing? Then we have this uh, famous saying, if you, ha if you are using uh, you know, web driver APIs directly in your uh, automation scripts, you are doing it wrong, same in Stuart. So there's a link to that in uh, Martin Fowler's uh, Blicky. So what is the problem here? Anybody? It leads to a lot of rework, fragile tests, etc. Right? So let's, uh, this is the context we are mostly familiar with. Let's try to see another context as well here. So here, say you have uh, your, the automation scripts are written in JavaScript using WebDriver.js, okay, which in turn talks to a Selenium server using a JSON wire protocol, which in, in turn talks to the browser. So that's how you can uh, bind any language libraries into WebDriver. Another possibility is like the system in which you're uh, running the script and the system in which actually the browser is running, they are different. So you want to send uh, you know, automation commands to another uh, system, again through JSON wire protocol, these are the things. So if you look at this point, so one place developers are using the API and you have multiple implementations of that and you have also other uh, language bindings trying to use this API. So it's kind of doing uh, multiple jobs here. So at any time when you design an API, the common uh, issue you run into is the level of abstraction. Whether the API has to be fine-grained or the API has to be coarse-grained. So what are the benefits or uh, disadvantages with that? If you go for very, very if you go for coarse-grained APIs, developers will have to write a lot of code, right? So step one, step two, step three, step four, like that, you'll have to do that repeatedly. On the other hand, if you go for coarse-grained API, it's good for uh, developers for writing the automation scripts, but implementations of the web drivers will become complicated. They'll have to implement more. Or you might not be able to expose all the capabilities of the browser through the APIs because it's slightly at a high level. So how do we solve this problem? Uh, let, let's just uh, take a look at here. So here uh, you have the, you know, this side, uh, it will become uh, more and more complicated if you make the APIs more uh, coarse-grained. On the other hand, a uh, developer will want a very APIs. So this is a problem. So how do we solve this problem? It's a very famous saying, right? Any problem in computer science can be solved just by adding another layer of indirection. So instead of everybody directly relying on WebDriver API, you develop a small library on top of WebDriver, which could help a developer to write better code. Okay, 
let's uh, quickly start with uh, a simple example of uh, usage of WebDriver. Then let's see how we could implement that using Jeb library. Okay. Then slowly let's convert our code to more idiomatic style of Jeb, how you should be ideally writing Jeb code. And then let's build upon that, adding more uh, you know, uh, patterns into that, like uh, page object and see how something, I mean, how our, you know, the entire uh, environment has to be developed. So let's quickly go through this. Okay, this is a simple web driver script. So I'm not using anything related to Jeb here. It's totally a web driver API usage. Just the difference is I have uh, written this in a Groovy file, not Java, just to make things uh, simpler. You would see the usage of uh, APIs, web driver, and uh, you know, I believe the what we are trying to do is very much evident from the code. Just to note here, uh, at the top you would see grapes, grab, etc. Right. So instead of, I mean, to run this program, you would need the Selenium jar, and the, here I am trying to use Firefox driver, so I would also need the Firefox driver jar. So instead of creating a Maven POM file and putting the dependencies there, I'm directly putting that content over here. So you would see at grab, I'm gi exactly giving the, you know, the Maven uh, group artifact and the uh, versions here. So what it will do is it will download these uh, libraries or jars and make them available in the class file. Let's just uh, run it. So it executed real quickly, right? I mean, I don't have any assertions or anything like that. Just usage of WebDriver. I mean, so far, things are fine. Now, what's, yeah, please. Everything is in directly in my code. I don't have to, you know, create uh, another XML or something like that. Say if you have script one and script two, if you are running them independently, you would have to mention that. So if you are using script one and from that you are accessing script two, then you don't have to. So wherever you are starting, you have to mention that. Uh, no, no, uh, I, I'm not, uh, say, say whenever you are running your entire test suite, so you'd be using some dependency managers and all. So here, everything is in one file. Just to make the demo simple, I'm using it. Say whenever I run a single script or uh, some simple code like this, I always use grape. But if I have, say, hundreds of files, then I, I could use Maven or uh, Gradle or anything like that. You, you could use still, but... I would say this is simple, right? It's like hard coding is okay when you have only one file, all right? You say you want to demonstrate something to your friend, just do that. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay. So let's try to introduce Jeb here. So what's uh, bad about that? What's bad about WebDriver? I mean, we already discussed that. Let's let's just try to generalize. So let's take a simple example. Say you meet your friend in the conference, and you ask him, "How did you reach here?" So what's the answer will be? came by public transport or bike or car, whatever, something like that, right? Instead, if he answers like, okay, I opened the door of front door of my house, I stepped out, then 
I, you know, step, I mean, I, you know, climbed down the staircase, then I got into road, then I walked uh, till the bus stop, then I got a bus. How do you feel that? Not, not so good, right? Is it the way we interact? To be? No. So in the same way, we, the developers, want to interact with any APIs at that high level. We don't want the APIs to be so dumb that we in 21st century, right? So that's the problem we are trying to solve step by step. So let's see how Jeb could help. Let's introduce library Jeb here. So Jeb is a open source project which is uh, written in Groovy language. Groovy is a dynamic language on, on JVM, so which compiles into class files, and later you can execute them on JVMs. And also, it's a Apache V2 license. So you, know, you could grab them, make your own changes, commercial friendly. right? And the latest version of uh, Jeb is uh, 0.9.3, it's very close to 1.0. So 1.0 should be out uh, somewhere uh, this year. And uh, I mean, the API is quite stable, and uh, you know, typically not much changes are expected uh, in 1.0. So, so we have been using WebDriver. So the gateway to WebDriver API is WebDriver class. So you, create, you get an instance of WebDriver class, and then you start using it. Similarly, the gateway to Jeb API is browser object, so which is in Jeb.browser, which wraps around WebDriver. So instead of talking directly to WebDriver, now you will talk to Jeb, and Jeb in turn will talk to WebDriver. So this is how uh, you could do it. So you create a new instance of uh, browser object by passing a driver object. Then you want to go to visit some URL, right? So you can say browser.go and you could give a URL. Now, hard coding things is not so good. That's what we just, uh, I mean, the people told about, right? Because if you want to use a URL, I mean, a driver in multiple places, right? You want to use the same driver not the different, different drivers. Or say you want to change the driver. Instead of Firefox, you want to use Chrome. You would want the change to be in one place rather than in multiple places. So this is how you do it. You, the configuration file uh, is named uh, uh, jeb, jebconfig.groovy. And uh, you put them as a Groovy DSL driver, and you, you could create. So here I'm creating a Firefox driver. So any customizations there you could do. So here I'm trying to make sure that when the Firefox window opens, it's maximized. Then I return the instance. Similarly, you could create a Chrome driver and return that. OK? Now, previously, I saw I created a new browser passing a driver object. Now, I don't have to do that, because it, it will be taken from the config file. So here I can say browser.go directly with browser, just a new browser. Then browser quit can be used to, to terminate that, I mean, stop that. Now, let's see how you could access elements in Jeb library. So at the top, the commented code shows how you could do it using WebDriver API. And below, you can see how you can do it in Jeb or using Jeb. So browser dot, you call the dollar method. And uh, you say name is J username. Now, once I got the element, I want to set some value into that text. So I can use the left shift operator, and I can pass the value. So again, you, you could see the web driver version and Jeb version. Then. Suppose you want to read the value present in the text field. You could say the field dot value, which will return it. So I'm just trying to print it here. So let's see that example. OK. 
So, my configuration is already present in uh, JEP config, which should be placed in the default package. Now, here you could see additionally, I am uh, including uh, JEP core library as well, in addition to Firefox driver. Then I am creating an instance of browser. The actual instance will be taken from the config file. And I say go, go to login.html, that's file, I mean that's a URL. Yeah. And then I enter the username and password. Then I click on submit and finally quit. I can just Okay, that's come. Yeah, please. Right. Ex exactly, you are right. So this is not the end result. We are just starting with. So instead of directly giving you this is the perfect way to write Jeb code, I'm slowly transitioning you from web driver API to Jeb API. Now let's see how you, you should ideally do it in Jeb. So this is just to get you familiar with Jeb. Okay. This is what we wrote. This is a very ugly code, right? Why is it so? Ah, uh, yeah, that's one of the options. I'll come to that, yeah. Apart from that, just from the API usage perspective. Yeah, I, I could do that, I'll come to that later. That's fine, apart from that. So every time you'd see browser, 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 that's a bit irritating, right? When you speak to someone, say your friend, say Raj, Hey Raj, how are you? Hey Raj, did you do this? Hey Raj, like that, you don't say that, right? First time you say that, then you do stop that. Again, we want our APIs to be intelligent enough, not so dumb. So once you tell that this is what you have to use, browser object, we want it to understand that. That's not so good. Apart from that, another one. Here I call browser.quit. What happens after that? Can I, the browser object reference is still available, right? Can I use that? If I try to say browser.go once again, what would happen? It will give some error, right? It's, I mean, illegal state sort of exception you will get. So, but still you can do that. That's not so good thing. So how we could improve that? So again, the API provides a static method called uh, drive, wherein, wherein you can pass a block of code. So drive will create an instance of browser and run the code block within that context, in, within the context of the drive. So once quit is called, you, you don't have the browser reference anymore and you can't do any you know, silly things there. So does it look better than the previous? Yes or no? Okay. So this is exactly the point he mentioned. So we have hard coded the URL. We don't want to do that. So we may want to run the test in multiple environments where the base URL could change. So you put the base URL in a chip config file. And when you say go login.html, it will be appended to base URL. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's exactly done using width. But in that case, I have to create an object, say new browser object. Then I should say the browser dot width and I could pass this code block. So what would happen is after the code is executed, still you would have the reference to that browser object. So we make that construction part private, which happens internally. Right. Then comes the assertion. 
once we have the, I mean, we have seen how we could uh, set the values and read the values. This is how you could assert, say, I'm uh, getting the value of uh, H1, and uh, which has some text value, and I'm checking if it is dashboard. So uh, that's just an uh, introduction of how we would use it. Okay. Now let's get into a bit more details of uh, the Ambigator APIs, how you could access uh, elements in the page. This is the syntax. So does it sound familiar, the dollar one? Anybody? Have you written dollar selector somewhere? jQuery, how many of you are familiar with jQuery? So yeah, so you already know how to use jQuery, right? Most of the web programmers. So instead of remembering web element dot by ID by so many classes and that, doing jQuery selectors or uh, CSS selectors is easy. So that is the power Jeb bring, gives you. So you could write CSS selectors or uh, jQuery selectors using the dollar method here. So first argument is the CSS selectors. Then you could say index or range. We will see more examples and uh, some attributes also. Let's get into the example. So this is the page snippet you have. So you have a bunch of uh, H2 elements. So I try to select H2 and say get the text of it. So there are four H2 elements here. So dollar H2 will select four elements, right? Then dot text will get the text, the content of the first item in that. That's how your jQuery API would also work. Then I'm trying to give a index value here. So I would say dollar H2 and one, so which gets the first one, zero and one. I try to get the size of that. How many H2 elements are there? Gives four. Now, I want to fetch multiple ones, not just one element. So I can provide a range operation here, 0, 0, 2, 0, 1, 2. Three elements will be accessed. So which returns a list of that. That's a bit of a trick in um, uh, Groovy here. Uh, I use uh, star dot which is equivalent to iterating and getting that value and collecting the result and returning it as a collection, I mean, a list. Here I have added a duration attribute, okay. and I'm trying to query by where duration is five, and there are two elements in that. Here I'm trying to get an H2 element where text is something. So I'm not going by ID or name or anything, by the content, that also you could do. So it's similar to attributes, so whenever you give text as an attribute, it will take the content, not the attribute itself. Also you can use uh, sort of, uh, you know, regular expressions, so there are some built-in options available like uh, contains here, I try to get all the H2 where text contains O. You would see the first two contains O there, page objects where O is uppercase. So if you want to include uppercase as well, you could do I contains. Here again, duration contains five, so you'd get uh, size as three. So Finding the child elements, you could do by I'm selecting, uh, you know, div dot languages, which selects the outer div. Yeah. Then I'm trying to find all the elements with class dot JVM. So what would be the result? Anyone? So two elements have JVM. Next, filter, again similar to jQuery. So I'm trying to filter from the current list, 
right? So I get all the languages and uh, filter where uh, JVM is there. This is the including filter. So if you want excludes, right? Not containing that, you could use uh, not. Okay, this is the most uh, discussed item, a uh, topic in the conference, I believe, page objects, right? So let's see how you could we could use uh, page objects. Okay, so this is a code we just saw previously. Let's just uh, ensure that it works before we try to refactor. Okay, it's asserted it's complete. So, first thing is we need a page object. So, let's uh, create a page object, say login page. So, which has to extend jeb dot page. Now, what do we do? So, here I am telling go to login page, right? So, now Instead of telling here, I should tell go to login page. So, how do I do that? I should put the URL here. So, URL, I make it internal to page. So, you are, even if the page URL changes, the change has to be in one place. Okay. Next. What do I need to do? I have to move all of these elements inside the page, so which I can do say static. Say I say username. I use the same selectors, but I just move it inside the page. Submit, is it required? You could put. Okay. Now, what should I do? Should I access username, password, submit within my code here or something else I should do. That will be still, it will be kind of a getter setter. So, it will eliminate that problem of, you know, URL changing and you want your code, I mean, you want to change only one place in your code. That problem is solved, but still it's tightly coupled. So, instead what I can do is, I say login, username, and password. So now, or you could say dot uh, value. Instead of doing this, I say login. Does it look good? Any questions? So, what I did is I created a page object, login page and I specified the URL there and I moved the elements inside the, you know, page object so that it's encapsulated over there and I'm just providing a login method which I can use to call that, I mean, to simulate that. Okay. 
Oh, sorry. Anything you see? A call? Ah, uh, need not be. Yeah. Missing method Sorry. So, when you are using page, you are supposed to use to instead of go. That's something went wrong there. Maybe we got the people. Password. Submit dot click, right? So, yeah, that's what you could do. Now, when you log in, the page changes to another page, right? So, let's just uh, create another page object. So, here, uh, we want kind of uh, verification if it is really at that page or not. So at so I can remove this part, which is more to dashboard. So I say at. So that's complete. So the assertion is now moved to the page itself. Similarly, I can uh, move this text also. I can put a placeholder uh, similar to username, password. I can say some heading or something. Then I can say heading or text. We could do that as well. Any typos? Anyway, that uh, that still possible. Let's move on. Okay. So we have seen a basic page object in action. 
let's get into modules. So, page objects are logical representations of a page, but there could be some content, some section repeating across pages, right? So, how do we handle that? Let's see a demo for that. So here I have taken, yeah, dashboard, uh, you may have the heading same, the search, you may want to use it across the pages. So let's see this. So for the reusable section, what I do is I create a module by extending module class. And similarly, the way how I created a page object, similarly, you create the content for uh, your module. Then the similar way I have provide, I provided a login method within the page, I provide a search method here, wherein I pass the query, which will uh, send the, set the text in the text box and uh, you know, uh, click enter, press enter. Right? Now, how to use it in the page? This is the page where I want to include that module. So within my content, I say search bar, uh, that's the variable what I want to use, and I say module and the module name. Is it clear? Then, uh, this is a result page I'm using, so I say uh, I go to dashboard page. Then I call the search on that. Then I just uh, assert that the page is actually moved to next page. That's the search result page, where uh, actually search result. So we could run that. Okay, it's complete. Any questions? I have a question there. So here, my dashboard page has a page title, and search result page as well has a page title. Here I say assert page title equal to search result. How does it know? which page title to be called in which page. So in the previous example, what I did is in the page demo, right, we said go to login page. Then here we said at dashboard page. So browser object what we saw earlier, that maintains which is the current page. So here when you said login page, it knows you are in login page. Then I, when I call login, there is nothing called no login method within browser, right? It is present in the page object. So browser knows which is the current page object and it you know, delegates that responsibility to the current page object. So login is delegated to current page, that is the login page. Now when you say at dashboard, it calls this verification. So now it knows that dashboard is the current page, right, or instance of that. So when you call Next heading, it should go and call the heading of dashboard. But in this example, I have not used it. I have just committed it. Then how does it know? If you look at it, yeah. If you look at the module definition, I created search box. Along with that, I specified two and a page object. That means when I click on that, which should be the page you should move to. Uh, this is one of the practices people use, right? A page object should return which is the next page object upon click, right? So due to this, it automatically knows which is the current page object. Instead of one, you could pass multiple values as well. You could pass a list as well. So what it will do is, now you said to search result page, it will call the at assertion on that. So if title is not dashboard, something else, maybe due to an error, it will skip that and go to the next element you passed here. 
that's allowed. So it will go one by one from the list and it will check this at assertion. If it is true, it will set that page as the current page object. Otherwise, it will try to get the next one. So that's so when, whenever you say at, there is an explicit uh, assertion made. So if there is no page object, something like that, it will fail. Okay, so let's uh, move back. That's one of the example where we saw one content repeated across pages. Let's get into another example. Anything repeating here? The rows are repeating. It's the same uh, structure is same, right? List of uh, some values. So you could use modules to solve this problem as well. This is how do you use it. So record represent a single line or a single row here. And here I have created a kind of uh, template which uh, using uh, groovy closure. So I pass an index. And the row is what is, you know, everything what is in the row is, will be in a TR tag. Within TR, you have multiple TDs. So when you search by TD, you would get multiple TDs by default. But my navigator allows me to specify an index as well. So if I pass 0, I would get the first one. If I pass 1, I would get the second one. Then I need the columns of that. Say I'm trying to get here product code and price. I just call this with multiple different index, right? Column of one will return the first TD. Column, sorry, it's the second one. First one, I just put the serial number. Uh, column of two will return the, so you could just uh, say, so I'm just index one and two is what I'm taking. Uh, price, and I'm trying to convert it to integer. Now, how do you use it in a page? So I have a page called a product page, which has a URL as usual, and within content, so previously, I gave a variable name, then I told module and the module class, right? Here, I gave module list, and I gave the module class, which is here. And then, this is the row selector. If there is only one, you don't have to give that also. I mean, if, if you're directly, if this is directly selecting, you don't have to give anything. In like, in my previous pages, there was only one search box. So if I dollar, I give you some idea of that search box, it should find it. In this case, there are multiple rows. So I need to tell that module which is the current row, um, right? So this will select all the TRs and put it into a list called products. Let's just see how you, you can uh, get the values, actually. So you say you go to product page, and product contains all the rows. So I say products.each, I'm getting product.productcode and product. A product is a variable I give here itself. So while iterating the current element. So any questions here? Questions? And that's how two use cases of uh, modules. So one content repeated across multiple pages, or same content repeated within the page. Next thing is, how to wait? Uh, why do we need wait? Anybody? Why do we need a waiting? So you may have an Ajax request, which may take some time to get the response. So until then, you want to wait to get the value of the result. Consider this example. You have a div whose ID is dynamic. There is no content. Say there is a button. Upon clicking that, an Ajax call is made, and the response is populated here in our text. These are all the ways Jeb provides you know, way, ways of uh, waiting. Right? So you use uh, wait for method, and you pass a closure here. So here it is, I say, by ID, dynamic, and get the text which is a kind of predicate. So it will wait until a, this div contains a text. Okay, Not infinitely. It will use the default timeout, which is five seconds. 
and uh, retry interval is by default 100 milliseconds. So every 100 milliseconds, it will check if that text is present in the D. If it presents, it will return. If it is not present, it will wait till the timeout. In the second case, you are explicitly saying, I want to use 8 seconds timeout. Okay? And the retry interval is set to default, again, 100 milliseconds. The third example, I am saying that I want to wait till 8 seconds with, I don't try every 100 seconds, instead retry only, uh, say, half a second. Next one is, you could pass a text also. So what does that mean? So in your config file, you could have a preset. So under presets, you could define multiple presets. I have defined a preset called slow, which says timeout is 12 and retry interval is 1. So if you want to use this across your uh, you know, application in multiple tests, you could use it as slow. You could categorize, say, some fast Ajax calls may be fast category. Slow means, say, slow category, like that. So then, slow previously, which was 10 seconds, now you want to reduce it to 8 seconds, or you want to increase it to 15 seconds, something like that. You just have to change it in one place, not go and change in every place. So waiting is real, real simple here. Let's see, uh, we saw how the JEB API can be used from the trivial example to a very practical uh, page objects, modules, and uh, wait, and so, so on, excuse me. And uh, now let's see how you can really integrate this in a, say, continuous uh, integration environment or so. So JEB provides uh, these uh, integrators. So typically, you may want to write your test in JUnit and uh, call JEB APIs could be, or uh, these are the options available, JUnit 3, JUnit 4, and uh, TestNG is available, and also Spock is also available. So I'm going to just give a demo of uh, Spock API. So if you are uh, using uh, Groovy, typically you would end up uh, using JEB, which is, uh, which is quite a good uh, you know, uh, testing framework, which is, again, on top of uh, JUnit 4 runner. So this is a sample uh, Spock specification, right? similar to JUnit you can consider. So JEB provides a base class, JEB reporting spec. So it helps you to capture the screenshots. So I, I just create one called uh, sample JEB spec. So this is how you define the specifications here in a very you know uh, descriptive way or specification, it's not a test spec. So you can give the description here. It need not be a, like a regular method. And then I say when, here I use the JEB APIs. So I'm not saying browser dot anything like that, or I'm not saying browser dot drive anything, because this already creates an instance of browser and it provides to me. So whenever I'm doing here, it's always within the context of browser. That context is already available. So we say to login page, we repeat the same thing what we did here, but there is no browser explicitly mentioned here. So I hope, uh, any questions here? I mean, the syntax should be pretty evident. So then, when, then, that's the expect, those are the syntax we used here. Let's see a demo of that. So I'm using uh, Gradle here. That's a failure, right? So let's see what is that.
this is where uh, you would get the 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 screenshots as well as the HTML file at the end of each test. That is by default it's taken. Now we just want to see the test report. So one failed we saw. So the error is shown here. So the page title uh, is actually you know result uh, result one search result one and search result. That's uh, so. This is left side is search result showing. Right side is uh, search result one. The actual is search result, but I am expecting it to be search result one. Let's just fix that and rerun. Pass. Now everything is passed. Let's say you want to take the screenshot in the beginning also. Right now, if you go here, the reports. So you could see the dashboard, and uh, next one is the search result. Those pages are available. you could see that is a page before also, which I just put it in one place. So wherever we, you want, you can just use report, or you, you can use a pass a string, which is the group. So it will create a folder and that kind of structure. And I'm using uh, Gradle here. I can run it with the multiple test by configuring it in Gradle, I'll say. You can add any browser, so that is controlled in the Gradle file. So you could add uh, which drivers you want, and you may want to add some dependencies and all. So there are few. Uh, these are the templates I took directly from the uh, Jeb. There is a sample Jeb repository. There is a sample uh, Gradle. There is one for Maven also. There is one for Grails if you like. If you are using Grails, that's much easier to do than this. And I have, uh, you know, I mean, all the patterns what we learned, we, we put it in this. That's how you could define. It. Ah, one more point I missed here is uh, I used uh, at stepwise, so that the tests are executed in order. So I may want the login to be done first, and then the rest of the things in this order. Or say you could also put it as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, say before running the entire test, you do a login. That's also possible. Depending on your how your use cases, you could uh, configure that. Way. So you know, uh, you have setup and uh, teardown for each test. So setup is ex executed before each test, teardown after each test, and uh, setup spec is executed uh, once for the entire spec, and uh, teardown spec after all the tests are run. So, uh, so by default, what happens is the browser session is maintained uh, for the entire. Uh, I mean, if you use stepwise for the entire uh, spec, it is maintained. Otherwise, all the cookies and all will be deleted after every test. So your login session will not will not be retained. So you, you could customize it the way you want. So so in summary, what does Jeb really provide to you? 
So WebDriver API is available to you. You can still, you can get the instance of uh, WebDriver and you can uh, customize if you want. In addition, say 80% of the case you use JBend. Some specific case you really want to control through WebDriver, that is still possible. Nobody is preventing from doing that. So you still have the power of WebDriver. You know, uh, learning jQuery selectors is pretty easy compared to learning any selection, selector APIs. So in no time you can learn that. So all people would already know that. So that's another part of it. And uh, page object patterns are set right away, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Then the power of Groovy. So if you know a bit of Groovy still, you can, uh, you know, uh, say in a complex situations, you can write a lot of templates uh, and more reusable code, something like the closures we used in that uh, rows and all. So that would be uh, another uh, benefit you would get. So with all these, JEP should be a very good, uh, you know, candidate for uh, developing uh, test automation. So, I mean, I'm not telling that everybody has to use JEP or something, but using plain WebDriver might not be a good idea, so you have to develop something on top of WebDriver. So, JEP has all the good practices of that, so most of the cases, JEP should cover pretty well. So, any questions? I have uh, the references I've put and all the code examples what I've used, uh, I've already, you know, put in the GitHub. And uh, present presentation slide uh, will be available in my slide share. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear. Uh -huh. Right, you're right. So what happens is from the performance point of view, if you can put everything in the CSS selector, that would get executed in the browser and it will return. That will be faster compared to getting everything and then you are doing a filter. So. It's like, uh, you know, you make it work and then you can make it better. That's, see, if usual cases, even if you use uh, groovy selectors, the attributes, still it would work. Say, a few milliseconds here and there will not make a difference. But say, if you're really facing some performance problems or if you want to improve it further, you can always try to move it to CSS selectors, the first argument. Anything else? Last minute? Well, thank you. <laughs>